Well, they were the Tasmanian bushfires of 1967. It was probably the worst disaster in the history of the state. 62 people dead, 1,500 homes destroyed, and more than 250,000 hectares of farm, bushland and forestry reserves burnt out. As we saw in that video, the fires brought about an almost complete breakdown of communication between emergency services in the state. The real problem with those fires was that the emergency services radio equipment was incompatible and everyone was operating on wildly different frequency bands. Intercommunication was impossible even when emergency units were within sight of each other. Fire brigade couldn't talk to police, police couldn't talk to ambulance and so on. Now this created chaotic and often tragic circumstances during the height of the fires. Afterwards, it was obvious to operational personnel that there was a real need to improve radio communication systems. In October 1967, less than 10 months after the fires, the state premier, Eric Rees, initiated the development of a state disaster plan, which included a radio communications plan. This was developed by the Postmaster General's department and accepted by the premier. That department was then responsible for all public communication facilities, including radio frequency management, an area now looked after by the Department of Communication. Responsibility included the determination of radio communications equipment and the allocation of radio channels for both private and public users. Within 12 months, the Postmaster General's Department Radio Frequency Planning Group had developed a VHF spectrum plan which was also compatible with existing manufactured land mobile radio communications equipment. Now, this plan fulfilled one of the main criteria, which was to permit unrestricted day-to-day -day domestic radio communications together with a unified emergency switching capability for the entire state and major islands. The VHF midband was selected to ensure that satisfactory radio communications could be maintained considering the highly mountainous terrain found in Tasmania. The plan was established in the 60s, an era prior to the widespread use of computer-assisted techniques. The growth of the plan has seen a greater reliance on modern computer technology. This centre now being linked through this terminal to the Central Coordinate Centre, Melbourne. The spectrum between 76 and 78 megahertz was selected and the idea was to allocate radio frequencies within this range to all users of the plan, leaving one liaison frequency free for high priority emergency traffic. Now, prior to the development of the Tasmanian radio communications plan, there'd been little coordination of frequency band allocation by any organization, so that when the time came to allocate specific frequencies, the planners found that some 30 business organizations were already using frequencies within the proposed spectrum. They would have to be persuaded to change their frequencies. Not as easy as it sounds, because in most instances, they would need new equipment to cater for the new frequency band allocated to them. Now, wisely, the government saved the day by agreeing to meet these costs. With these obstacles overcome, the planners then had to allocate specific frequencies to proposed users of the plan. Now, present users of the plan include 46 municipal councils, 10 state organizations, and 16 private companies. The private companies include people like Australian newsprint mills and Australian pulp and paper mills who have mobile stations throughout the forest regions of the state covering the vast tracts of timber reserves. With these mobile units, they can communicate with each other as well as with councils and all emergency organisations. Also using the plan are commercial and industrial organisations as well as isolated farmers and graziers throughout the state. The spectrum then looks something like this. Now, this part has been allocated to the users. And here is the state liaison frequency, 76.79 megahertz. Every user has this frequency fitted to their radio together with their domestic frequency and usually that of a neighboring organization or one with which they communicate frequently. There are over 76 active frequencies within the plan, and each one is identified by a code. Now, this example shows some of the fire service frequency codes. For example, the state liaison frequency is 76 decimal 79 megahertz. It's Z, whilst a municipal council, Sorrell Council, for example, is C7. 
A code plan like this is available to all users and is kept near the radio. It lists all users and the code allocated to them. Each user is also given the channel code label, which is affixed to mobile units like this one, which is used by the state fire service. A radio like this can cost less than $1,000. Other emergency organisations around Australia and the rest of the world need to carry masses of expensive equipment to have the communication facilities we have in Tasmania with just one small radio. For example, there was a case of a USA County Fire Department needing a Ford Galaxy station sedan to carry $25,000 worth of radio equipment to give them access to 10 frequencies. That's a lot of money and a lot of space that could be put to better use. In addition to fixed radio base stations, the Tasmania Police, Tasmania Fire Service and the State Emergency Service all have mobile command and control radio base stations which are able to communicate with on-scene units. There are over 240 base stations around the state, and as you can see from this map, the plan has the whole of the state well covered. There are also several thousand mobile stations and over 500 portables and handheld radio units. The plan's frequency span currently is 4.26 MHz, whereas in 1967 it was very narrow, only 0.69 MHz. Probably one of the worst situations under which the plane would have to operate would be if a number of emergency organisations were required to converge on one site. Take a bad car accident, for example. Now, usually the bringing together of a number of services with closely related radio frequencies is asking for trouble. To check how the plan would work under such conditions, a convergence exercise was held in southern Tasmania back in 1980. All major emergency services gathered in close proximity to each other and communicated within and without the site without any problems. Now, as predicted, the exercise proved that Tasmania has set up a simple yet highly efficient radio communications plan that was ready to meet all communication needs in a disaster situation. To keep up with changing technology and to ensure that the individual requirements of all users are met, a state disaster radio communications committee was set up. The 11-man committee is made up of representatives from the State Emergency Service, Department of Communications, Tasmanian Police, Tasmania Fire Service, both country and urban, Tasmanian Ambulance Service, Hydroelectric Commission, Department of Main Roads, National Parks and Wildlife Service, Forestry Commission and Municipal Councils. Well, that's basically how the plan operates. Now, let's see how it works in practice. The action on the video we're about to watch takes place in Mount Field National Park in Tasmania Southwest. <laughs> Nancy and Donna are spending the weekend walking in Mount Field National Park. They were going along quite nicely until time for a rest and a cup of billy tea. Now we'll see how the plan assists in times like these. Dave the Fire Watcher changes to the Australian Newsprint Mills frequency to check the coordinates with their fire lookout. Mount Lloyd, this is Mount Faulkner, over. Roger, Mount Faulkner, this is Mount Lloyd, go ahead. Roger, I have a smoke in the Mount Field area. From me it's bearing 210 degrees. Can you pick it up and give me a cross bearing, over. Roger, stand by. Roger, the bearing uh, I have from Mount Lloyd, 98 degrees, 98 degrees, over. Roger, thanks Mount Lloyd. Van Faulkner out. Then he changes to the Forestry Commission frequency to check the coordinates with them. 
Belchers. This is Mount Faulkner. Over. Mount Faulkner, this is Belchers. Over. Roger Belchers. I have a smoke on bearing 210 degrees in the Mount Field area. Could you give me a cross reference on that? Over. Uh, yes, I've just seen it too. It's on a bearing of 125 degrees from here. Over. Roger, that's 125. Over. Yeah, further here. Belchers out. Mount Portman, Once he's established exactly where the fire is, he contacts the fire brigade headquarters at Cambridge, near Hobart. Cambridge, this is Mount Faulkner. Over. Mount Faulkner, this is Cambridge. Go ahead. Over. Roger, I can see a fire in the Mount Field National Park area. Cross-reference from Mount Lloyd and Mount Belchers puts that at grid reference 105545. Over. I'll confirm that grid reference 105545. The fire service at Cambridge Over. is now in control and they radio the airborne spotter Roger, plane using the fire Cameron. service frequency. Spotter 9, spotter 9, this is Cambridge. Over. So go ahead, Cambridge. We have a report of a fire from Mount Faulkner in the Mount Field National Park area. Grid reference 105545. Would you investigate, please? Over. Will do. Spot a nine out. Whilst assessing the extent of the fire, two people are spotted, and our young friend's plight is radioed Thank back to headquarters sir. by simply switching to the headquarters frequency. Headquarters can then notify the rangers of the existence of the girls. She's a beauty, Nick. She's a bit big for us to handle, I think, by herself. Yeah, I think we'll have to get assistance, but right. let's have a go at it. I'll call base. Right. Mountfield base, this is mobile 40 receiver. Mobile 4, this is Mountfield base. Go ahead, over. Uh, Roger, it's uh, a little big for us to handle at this stage by ourselves. Uh, I suggest you get a couple of tankers up here, uh, and uh, Frank and I will check the two walkers in there at the moment and uh, check the fire while we're in there. Since the fire is threatening the nearby timber reserves of Australian newsprint mills, and on the other side there are a few farms which may be in danger, the Cambridge base will notify other fire brigades in the area and A&M who will send in units to assist. I will arrange further assistance. Mountfield out.
Information provided by the fire spotter in the plane indicates that the fire is closer to the highway than expected. The fire boss has taken the precaution of radioing the police to ask if a car can set up a roadblock on the highway. Just imagine how chaotic this scene would be if the various organisations involved could not communicate with each other. The ambulance officer in the helicopter has now changed to ambulance frequency. This link-up is another valuable day-to-day -day use to which the plan is put by the emergency services. TOS Hobart, ICU, this is helicopter. How do you receive? Over. Yeah. Loud and clear, helicopter. Over. Roger, ICU. We have an 18-year-old patient with burns. Name, Nancy Harper. This patient has received partial thickness to deep burns to her face, neck, anterior chest and hands from the explosion of a shellite camping stove. OTA is 15 minutes, over. Roger, helicopter. Received that. Transport this patient to triage and we'll be waiting for your arrival. ICU, out. an example of the Tasmanian radio communication plan and operation. It must be remembered that although this situation is extremely plausible, it was a simulated exercise. Equally important for you all to note is that in this day-to-day -day emergency situation, the plan will be utilised to its greatest benefit. Each year there are thousands of operations where the communication plan is used, exhibiting its flexibility in many different situations, and not only in major disasters. The Tasmanian radio communication plan was born of a disaster which was far worse than anyone could have predicted. Although the designing and implementation of the plan took up time, manpower and money, everyone who uses it knows that the costs were little compared to the savings to the community. These costs are continually kept to a minimum by the overall cost efficiency of the plan. Now, as observed, the radio communication plan, in practice, works very simply for such a precise and complex development. A development which surely places Tasmania in the forefront of disaster and day-to-day -day emergency situation control. A unique plan in its development, structure and operation. Tasmania can be justly proud. <laughs>